I mean, the whole world's out there. It's the payments that you pay for the fun and for the peace and for the whatever it is that the world's got out there, you know? And yet everybody's searching for that moment when they can find just a touch of peace in this thing we call life because life is a tail end kicking proposition. I mean, you got to understand one thing. None of us get out of here alive. Okay? So, so... Here we are, people who have the Word of God. We have the presence of God. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Father. And we walk around and look like we died a week ago and haven't got the guts to lay down anywhere. I don't, <laughs> I don't hardly get that. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can tell I'm saved. I don't, care. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't dance. I don't have a good time. I don't sing. I don't laugh. I don't go to movies. I don't watch TV. I don't cut my hair. My skirt's not too short. My hair's not too long. Bless God. If I like it, I stop it. If it tastes good, I <laughs> Spit it out. If it looks good, I'd take it off. And just think, if you get saved, you can have all the fun I'm having. Won't you be blessed? I'd just like to say, I'd rather smoke dope. Because that'll make you happy for a minute, amen? But see, we're not looking for happy for a minute. We're looking for happy forever. You know, we're not even just looking for happy in the sweet by and by. We're, we're looking for a way to be happy and prosper down here. What does the Lord say? I have a plan for you. I have a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. That's what God's plan is. What is bumming us about, out about that? Why doesn't that work for some of us? I mean, I, I just, you know, huh. it, it, I, I've been deciding that what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a study on God's hard sayings. The things in my life that are hard to do. Because I've got this feeling that if I dig the well a little deeper, then the water's going to get a little sweeter. I'm just saying. I mean, really, you look at a lot of people's experience with God and it's five miles wide, but it's only an inch deep. And I don't care how wide your puddle is, puddle's a puddle, amen? <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? If you dig a hole six feet across and 20 feet deep, you got a well. And the sweet water doesn't come from the puddle. The sweet water comes from the well. But when you cut through those stratas to get down that deep, there's going to be days when you got some smooth sailing and there's going to be some days where you meet resistance. There are going to be days when you're doing easy stuff and there are going to be days when you're doing hard stuff. And the truth of the matter is, Everybody rejoices in the Lord when they're doing the easy stuff, but when you hit that bedrock, buddy, and you got to drill through that, that's when people say, well, you know what? I think I'll just go on city water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll just get whatever I got coming from the government. I'll just get whatever I got coming from somebody else that's done the work for me because I haven't got the, I haven't got the gumption to dig my own well. All I've got is the will to turn a tap. Then you get basically what you deserve when you do that. Because every bit of the tap water we got around here, it's not fit to drink, you know? Anytime you got to turn on your faucet and put the Brita under there, just so you can filter out the crud that's in there, there's something wrong with that, amen? <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, okay? We were up um, North Georgia yesterday and we drank water that was absolutely pure. We drank water that was absolutely pure because it came from such a deep place that there was no way for it to get polluted at the surface because it came up and it was used fast, fast, amen? 
You can't let this stuff sit around. You can't let this stuff stagnate. You can't buy a carton of milk and put it on the back porch in 80 degree weather and go out at the end of the day and chug you some milk unless you just like sour cream. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> stuff spoils. One of the things that happens with us is we receive all this good stuff and then we just stick it on a shelf. Then we wonder why when we go back for it, it's stale, it's moth-eaten, uh, bugs have got into it, it's grown mold, you know, and then we go, well, this thing doesn't work. I don't even think, why did God even give me this thing? This nasty old thing, this, this, this doesn't even work. Whew, you know what? That wasn't, God's, that wasn't God's fault. It was a perfectly good gift when he gave it to you. You know, it was you that set it aside and let it get rusty and crusty. Hello? And that's not what God wants us to do. That's not what God wants us to do. Listen to me. When God gives us something, it's because he wants us to use it. He wants us to use it for our own good, but he also wants us to use it for the good of the kingdom and the people in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. And I mean, if all you've got to give people is rusty and dusty, and people are going to go someplace else even if, they, even if they have to find something falsely tasty. Amen? Look. I can't hear myself anymore. Can everybody else hear me? Oh, good. I hate monitors. I've heard me. I'm not that interested. I'm just saying. Yeah? Twinkies taste good. Twinkies taste good. Come on. Twinkies taste good, right? But they're absolutely poison. They, they don't have any food value to them whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? But they are so packed with preservatives that they have a shelf life of a million years or something, okay? <laughs> they last longer than most nuclear substances. If there's ever, ever a holocaust that wipes out humanity, there's going to be two things left. There's going to be cockroaches and Twinkies. <laughs> and the cockroaches won't eat the Twinkies, that's right, you know? So there's a lot of stuff out there in the world that really tastes good. And if you just go for the tasty, you can shove any old thing you want to down your throat. Amen? But if you're going to take, if you're going to go for the things that are nutritious, they're going to have to be uh, devoid of those false preservatives. Okay? And it's going to have to be an eternal goodness that gets into your bones and your blood and your flesh that makes it worth doing and worthwhile having. Amen? <laughs> That's why the Lord says, write my word on your heart so you, won't, so you won't depart from it, so you won't sin against it. It has to become part of you. Amen? Not just something you throw on on Sunday morning. Not just something you do out at the restaurant when you pray for your dinner because you want everybody to see how, 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 how holy you are. Not, not just so you can get over on your friends by saying, well, you know, I go to church and I don't do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wonder who loves who around here when it comes to God because you're a this and you're a this and you're a this. And I thank God so much that I'm not like that man. <laughs> we heard about that dude in the Bible, amen? amen? And the Lord said, well, you were doing right well up to then. <laughs> right there you screwed it all up you know what I mean you're doing great until you took it out on somebody else amen are, are you with me here yes. okay so it's got to be all the time it's got to be a lifestyle it, it, it's got to be the vi listen it's got to be the vital part of who you are amen in the word where the Lord says you must eat my body and you must drink my blood if you're going to have part in me and uh, people didn't understand that, and they freaked out, and people were going away and getting ticked off, and, eh, you know, I mean, really, you know, <laughs> these people uh, ate kosher, right? They killed something, hang it up, let all the blood drain out, you know, before they even put it in their mouth. And now Jesus is saying, look, I just want to say one thing. You got to drink my blood. You know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's like uh, uh, Dracula. Standing up here and saying, trust me, I'm a doctor. You know, I mean, it's not something you're just going to jump up and do. Blah, blah. You know, I mean, I'm just saying, you know. Jesus says you got to do this and you got to eat my flesh. Well, you know, hey, let's be cannibals. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is not something you can get really jerked around about unless, unless you understand what he's saying, okay. 
everything you eat becomes part of your, of your molecular structure. Everything you drink becomes part of your molecular structure. The food and drink that you take in are the things that are actually the basic building blocks of your being, of your body, of, of, of who and what you are, okay? You, you get what I'm saying? It, it, it's what nourishes your DNA. You, you, you follow me, okay? All the vitamins and all the stuff and all that, you know, it's got to go in there and it's got to feed you and it's got to become part of you. And when Jesus says, you got to eat me and you got to drink me, he's saying, look, this can't be an external religious exercise. This has got to be what makes you who you are. This has got to be the very building blocks of the cells of your makeup. You've got to have this in your DNA. It's got to be deep. You can't rely on these puddles. You've got to have a well, honey. That's what the Lord says. Amen. Well, I don't believe that. Well, gosh, I guess I'll just blow that away. If you don't believe it, it couldn't possibly be true. But I just don't understand. Right, you don't understand. But that's a good thing, okay? Because the Bible says his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So if you understand, it's probably not God. <laughs> Evelyn Underhill said, if God is so small he can be understood, he is so small that he shouldn't be worshipped. Do you really, really want to worship what you can dream up? I don't. <laughs> Do you want to have a God that's so small he can fit in your imagination? I don't. I know. Hey, I know what's in my head. Hello. Th that's a neighborhood I don't even feel safe in by myself. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> you know what I'm saying? I need something bigger. I need the mystery of it all. I need it to bathe the, the, the very building blocks of my being. I need, to, I need to be able to walk in this all the time. Well, what happens when you screw up? Look, don't worry about it. Bodies have a way of eliminating waste. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, Rick Godwin said one time, he's, uh, he had a, there was a split and people were leaving the church, you know. Anybody that's been in the ministry more than 20 minutes has been through that. So, <laughs> so some Job's friend came by and said, well, what do you think now, Rick? And he said, well, this is a body, and, and bodies are organic, and any body uh, that's organic is going to eliminate waste. He said, so that's what's happening to our body here at Eagle's Nest. We're just eliminating waste. And the guy said, did you just call? No, I didn't. We're eliminating waste because they're wasted here, because they've lost the vision of this place. So here, they're waste. Someplace else, they'll probably be just fine. Because they'll have a vision they can live with, amen? Be part of, be bathed in, be washed in. But here, they've lost that, and so they're waste, and they need to move along. Because if your body doesn't eliminate waste, all it does is become toxic. And it'll affect everything around you. It'll affect every organ in the body. If your kidneys fail, it'll make everything stop. If your liver fails, it'll make everything stop. You, you get what I'm saying? All right. So we've got to have this wholesome stuff. It's got to work all the time. Yeah, we're going to fall on our faces, but you know what? Body has a way of eliminating those things, and we learn from our mistakes and go on. Every once in a while, a Twinkie will slip, slip in. But if you've got a wife like mine, he, <laughs> you won't do that often. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, she, no, no, no. That's why we need to be part of the body of Christ. Because you can think it's a biscuit. Somebody needs to come up and go, Rico, it's a, it's a Twinkie. <laughs> Spit that out and don't do it again. Yeah, but I was convinced it was a biscuit. But you only convinced yourself it was a biscuit because you wanted to eat it. And you were coming up with an excuse that would give you the freedom to go ahead and chow down on that. Dude, it's a Twinkie. And sometimes we can convince ourselves of stuff to the point where we don't really see the reality of it all. We scarf it and we don't realize that we've eaten poison until we're sick. So that's why we need a pastor. That's why we need friends. That's why we need to have a big circle. So people are going, I saw somebody spray ant spray on that uh, uh, before. Do you really think you want to eat it? Yeah, well, you know, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. 
I don't know where this came from. It's never in any of my notes. Did you notice that uh, I sit down during praise and worship? Uh, you praise and worshipers, let me just say, I mean, the leaders, please let me say that wasn't because I had any problem with anything that went on during praise and worship. It was wonderful, wonderful. And thank you very much for being so good. I really, really appreciate having to get up and follow that. It's not so much you, but look at her. Oh, my, gee, you got to have guns. Anyway, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I can still put six in a Dixie cup at 50 yards. Uh, ooh rah. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> even if your daddy misses, your uncle's going to get him. You know, anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, it was wonderful, wonderful. But there's a, a thing called a thin place and uh, spiritually speaking. And a thin place is where heaven and earth comes very close for you, okay? It's like the song where heaven and earth exchange a big sloppy kiss. Well, your thin place is right where the lips meet, okay? And you'll hear from, you'll hear from the Lord in that place, you know? And for me, praise and worship is that place. And it's often that I sit during praise and worship and the Lord just talks to me. He just pours things in my heart as, as these talented people are up there just giving their hearts to God and just, and just worshiping the Lord. And worship takes me, to, it takes me to the well is where it takes me. Amen? I don't care anything about flashing around with the goldfish. I want to swim with the whales. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> Tongues. Anyway, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I speak well. Isn't that impressive? Me and Dory just keep swimming, 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 just keep swimming. Anyway, if you don't get that, I'll explain it later. Hallelujah. Of course, when I explain the jokes, they're not funny. You know? So, <laughs> you're just getting the first one, aren't you, honey? Bless your heart. Anyway, she's so, Anyway, um, Presbyterian. Anyway, so, um, no. Uh, so we got to have, well, I sit there and God talks to me about stuff. And the Lord talked to me this morning about stuff. And the minute I stood up, now I prepared a sermon. We went past that while I was sitting there. Then when I stood up, he said, only kidding. And he took me in this direction. So I've prepared three sermons and I'm not preaching any of them. That's just God, though. That's what it means when it says you need to be instant in season and out of season. And I do my best to try to make sure that I'm eating the right stuff all the time and that my, my DNA is bathed continually in the presence of the Lord and so uh, I can be instant in season and out of season. Whatever he wants to say, I've become so secure in that that I'll be willing to stand up and make a fool of myself if that's what God wants me to do. That doesn't make me special. It makes me a Christian. Amen? Yeah, but you're an anointed man of God, true enough. But you're a blood-bought, spirit-filled child of the Most High. And you got it going on too, amen? It's no different. Your anointing is no different than mine. It's just where we use it may be different where we're planted, whatever garden we're sprouting in. Amen? And, and you need a lot of different things in a lot of different gardens, you know? People that are growing beans don't really need a whole lot of turnips. But what about the guy that raises the turnips? And you got to have turnips so you don't get sugar. Right? Oh, no, that's beets. Turnips, beets, ah, whatever. They're dirty. You pull them out of the ground. You chow on them. What can I say? It's like potatoes. Potatoes are good for you, really. They're the perfect food. It's all the stuff you put on potatoes that make them bad. Amen? I'm just saying. Hallelujah. So, the Lord is saying this stuff this morning because there are those of you in here that need to hear it. Okay? And the Lord is saying the things that he said to me while I was sitting there because you need to hear it. I may never preach this another place. This may only just be for here. Maybe God will let me uh, share this with other people. But, but right now, this is for you because it, it came to me in your church. It came to me while you guys were praising and worshiping the Lord. Okay, It came to me in this place. I pay attention to those kind of things. Amen? And for those of you that are streaming, 
uh, you know what? It's no mistake that you tuned in today. No mistake whatsoever. Amen? So, so here we go. I'm going to study the hard sayings of the Lord because I want to get through those hard layers so I can get down to the deep water. I want to... I want to uh, uh, there's a difference between being content and being lazy. Amen? Paul said we should be content. But he didn't say we should be lazy. You know, I mean, there were times when he had to make tents to make a living. Amen? But he never moved into one that I know of. You, you know what I'm saying? You understand? So we can't just sit back and decide, like, like Pastor said, fall asleep in the spirit. Been here, done that. I've done my duty. I showed up. I'm here. Let's get it over with so we can get out of here and beat the Methodist to the fried chicken. <laughs> we know. There's something about being willing to go deep. There's something about being willing to think outside the box. There's something to be said for not being the kind of people that say, we never did it that way before. That's not what I, how I was raised. But I just don't understand that. I mean, I don't get it. Uh, I, don't need, I don't even know why we have to hear that. I, you know, because you get, you get into this comfortable place. You get into this place where you can actually sleep with your eyes open. And those guys who've never been in the military don't know how to do that. But those of us that have been in the military, we certainly do know how to do that. And you get to the place where you can sleep with your eyes open. You look like you're here, but you're not. And then when somebody says, okay, we need to step out of the box, you freak out because you have forgotten what it's like outside the box. You've become so content in the box. You've become so satisfied with the box that now when somebody says, we got to go past the box, we got to go a little bit deeper, we got to chisel through the rock barrier, we got to do these things, you start freaking out because you're, you're, you're fairly content in the box and you feel safe in the box. I know this, so I'm safe. I'm used to this, so I'm safe. This is how I was raised, so I'm safe. This is what mom and daddy said, so I'm safe. Hallelujah. Walls will keep you safe, but they also keep you in. Walls keep things out, but walls also keep you in. And the thing about walls is they really limit your view. Especially the higher the wall, the less the view. Amen? And boy, I tell you, religious walls are high. I mean... Here it is Sunday morning, and I bet you the Baptist down the road can't even see us. I bet we can't even see the Catholics. Just saying. I don't know, and I don't want to know. I just know what I've been told. Them people down there, whoever they are, they don't know Jesus the way I do. They don't love Jesus the way I do. They don't have it in their hearts the way I do. They don't live in the box. <laughs> the box is a place of very shallow water. I mean, a, the box is the place of the puddle. And you got to go outside the box to dig, dig the well. Because the well dug in the box will ruin the foundation of the box, and the box will fall in on you. And you can get buried alive in the box. You can get smothered in the box. You can die in the box. You can lose it all right there in the box, safe and secure with everything piled on top of you. Die because you've been drinking stagnant water because that's all you got in the box. Amen. You got to go somewhere else to dig a well. Just saying. And don't worry about God. He's not in the box because the Bible says his mercies are new every day. His mercies are new every day. The Lord does not, you know, hey, Lord, I need those mercies I had last week. Sorry, I got new mercies for you today. Your mercy. You know how it, it, the children of Israel were in the desert. Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. They were fed every day. That's because God gave them new mercies every day. Every day. They couldn't even hoard up the stuff that God gave them from the day before because it would all go stale. Amen because you'd have to put it in a pot or in a box or on a shelf someplace until you needed it. And God doesn't want you to use his gifts that way. We've already been through that. Hello. 
So God's mercies were new for the children of Israel every day. And his mercies for us are new every day. But Lord, yesterday we were in the box and it wasn't like that. I know, but today is another day and we're out here and we're digging a well and you're going to need different mercies to do that than you did while you were in the box. And so I'm giving you new mercies. Don't worry about it. Leaving the box is not going to make you leave the mercies, the goodness, the gifts, or the blessings of God. Because he goes with you. That's the best thing about the 23rd Psalm, you know? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Not because God's in the bleachers cheering me on. Not because God is waiting at the finish line to see if I can do it by myself. Not because God is up in heaven shooting lightning bolts at my butt so I keep moving, you know? I'll fear no evil because he is with me. And his mercies are there for me because he's with me. Amen? Amen? <laughs> this is good stuff. I hope you're writing some of it down. You know what I mean? Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, I'm going to see if I can get into my sermon. It's in the electric thing. <laughs> I feel so uptown. But you know, I still have my pen and I still have my notebook because they don't run out of power. And they don't crash. Hello. Anyway, I want to read you something. Back to the hard sayings. Bible says for us to be kind, compassionate, and forgiving. It says we should be this way with our friends, but it also says we should be this way with our enemies. That is not my training. That is not my training. Not at all. But that's what the word says. In order for me to be that kind of person, I'm going to have to get out of my box because my box got a whole different set of rules and priorities and doesn't have much to do with forgiving my enemies. It's just how I was raised. It's just what I understand. It's just what I've been taught. You ever hear that? Yeah. But that's what the Bible says. Listen to this here. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Mother Teresa wrote that. These are the hard things to do. This is where the well gets stuck. This is where we get outside the box. This is where it isn't about our training or how we were taught or what mom and daddy said. It's about staying in the mercy of God every day of your life, being washed in the power of the Lord in every fiber of your being and saying, okay, this is hard, but I need that deep water and I want to dig that deep well and I want you to give me the courage and the energy to break through this barrier that I have in my life that keeps these good things from flowing to me. I mean, it, 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 it's just the way it's supposed to be. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs. Here, I'm going to give you this. You need this. How many times has somebody come up and said, Rico, you need to read this book, man. It'll change your life. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Then you look at it, and it's how to raise Alsatians. And you're going, well, I don't raise German shepherds. 
So how's this going to change my life? Well, it changed my life. <laughs> oh, well, if it changed your life, it must going to be changed. You know what? My needs are not your needs. We're not all the same. God didn't use a cookie cutter to create us. We are all individually, wonderfully, beautifully, and amazingly saved. We have a personal relationship with God, and our needs are our needs. And if you want to help somebody, find out what that is and step into that. I know it's a hard thing to do. But if we want a deep well, we've got to do the hard things. It says, what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid, now, whew, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ Jesus forgave you. Seems fairly clear. Seems fairly clear. That doesn't mean because it's clear it's easy. But, you know, we, we, we can't just pick out the things that we want to do. We just, can't, we just can't live at the soft dirt level, you know. If we're really going to get there, if we're really going to get the sweet water, when we hit this kind of thing, we're going to dig through. We're going to chisel through. How am I going to do that? I've lived so many years and I've never been able to do that. Keep on chiseling, honey, because the Lord is with you and he will get you through. And it may take some time, but the only way that you won't make it is if you decide to chicken out. If you decide that you're going to be comfortable. If you decide you're going to make a tent and move into it. Amen. You're going to run behind the walls. You're going to make yourself a fort. You're going to throw down the moat once a year, run out, grab a sinner, kicking and screaming, drag him into the kingdom, and, and, and put up the flag and say, hold the fort, for I am coming. <laughs> I have got no desire to hold a fort. That's part of my training that I can still use. You know? Marines don't hold things. We take things. You know? Every place we put our foot, God Almighty has given to us. And we believe that. We, we really do, even if, even if we're, the hardest core Marine at the end of the day will tell you he's a servant of the Most High God because, you know, at the end of the day, we're the ones that are going to protect the streets in heaven. <laughs> I'm just saying. We're not even sure the Navy and the Army are going to get there, but we'll be there, you know. And every time God comes out of his helicopter, we'll give him a salute. Amen? Because if we can do that for Obama, we can certainly do it for Jesus Christ. I'm just saying. Anyway, don't get me. I go political here on you in a minute. For me, going political is the same thing as going postal. We don't want to do that, okay? We just don't want to do that. But we, we're we taught you take the ground, you hold the ground. You take the ground, you hold the ground. You take the ground, you hold your ground. You know, it's a very hard thing for us to get it through our head when it's a smart thing to retreat. Sometimes it is a smart thing to retreat. But the Lord... It's different with the Lord because he says, I'll give you everything you put your foot on. So you have to continue to go. and continue. You can't be content with where you are. Not if you're going to have a deep well. You just got to keep working at it until you win. But the Lord says that life belongs to those that persevere, that persist, that don't give up. Wow, just saying. I know they're hard sayings. <laughs> But if we want to have the deep in our lives, we've got to go back. We've got to go to the hard things. And we've got to make sure that we're doing the things that gives us the ability to be the people that we are supposed to be in the kingdom of God. Because there are people, did you hear what that said? And you do these things because it blesses the listener. Here's the deal. At the end of the day, it's not our walk and it's not our confession that really will change the world around us. It's people seeing how we are. Not what we do, but how we are. What we're made of. What's washing our building blocks. What's, what's affecting our DNA. 
we come up against that we keep going or do we wuss out like everybody else? Are we satisfied with being comfortable or do we need to be committed? Amen? I mean, we were taught these things when we went into the military. We were like everybody else. When you go in the Marine Corps, they do everything they can to break you down. Not break your spirit, but break down what you think you know. Because the truth of the matter, at 19, you don't know squat. You may think you do, but you don't. And one of the first things that has to happen is all the stuff you think you know has got to be cracked off of you. And you've got to wind up just naked as a baby chick. Okay? And then the guys who know what they're talking about, they start putting the right kind of armor on you. That's why when you start, first start out, you know, hiking, you do a 50-mile hike, you carry an 80-pound pack. You do a 100-mile hike, you carry an 80-pound pack. In my whole life in combat, I never carried an 80-pound pack. An 80-pound pack will get in your way. But, buddy, if I'd had to, I could have because I was trained to do that. And I had to be taken down to nothing. And all that I thought I knew had to be stripped away from me. And I had to come out of the box of being raised at home. You know, I had, to, I had to come out of the box of having my mother come in saying, Honey, you need to get up. It's time for school. Come on, sweetie, you're going to miss the bus. I had to wake up to and a trash can flying down through the middle of the barracks. Get yourself up out of there, you maggots right now. You're gonna be a you're gonna be a disgrace to my beloved core. I'm gonna rip Oh, I there's so much of it I can't say. But anyway, <laughs> it was definitely out of the box. But all of a sudden, it became the way I walked. And those things became second nature to me so that when I was in combat, not only could I be a benefit to myself, but I could be a benefit to everybody else. And you know what? My job to tell the other guys how to do their job, and it wasn't my job to do their practice, and it wasn't my job to make sure that they did all the things that they needed to do to learn what they needed to, to know. It was my job to learn to fire my rifle. It's my job to learn to carry an 80-pound pack. It's my job to learn all the medical knowledge I needed to be somebody that saved those Marines' lives. That was my job. And what made me proficient was I practiced at what I was supposed to know and let the other guys practice at what they were supposed to know. And when we came together, we made a unit that was able to adapt, improvise, and overcome. The raw. You, you get me? I guess what I'm saying is that there's so many of us that settle for so little. Uh, there are so many of us that are just so self-satisfied because we can recite the rules. There are so many of us that think we're busting heaven wide open because we're telling everybody else what to do. But the truth of the matter is, it's your practice that makes you proficient. It's your courage that keeps you going. It's your determination that busts through the rock walls. And it's your dissatisfaction with puddles that make you seek for the deep. And all of us seek for the deep. We can convince ourselves we don't, but inside of us there's always something scratching, saying, John, there's a little bit more. Rico, there's a little bit more. Gia, there's just a little bit more. Always something scratching. Always, always. I don't know how to end a service like this because... I don't know if I can lay hands on you and impart this to you. Um, I never considered it because I've never preached any of this before. Uh, you know, it's like old dogs. They say old dogs can't learn new tricks. But you know what? 
If you're a smart dog, you'll learn new tricks every time you get a chance. Hello? Amen. You know, because the way to get across the street at John's house is not the same direction you take at Myrtle's house. Amen? And if you don't want to be a flat dog, you'll be a smart dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Man, I'm not interested in being a flat dog, although I am kind of interested in flat cats. You know, they get run over, they're on the side of the road, they're flat, and they get crispy like that. And then you can play one of my favorite games, which is called Sail Kitty. <laughs> and the dog will go for it. Anyway, so uh, I'm just saying, I don't know where that came from. I think I went crazy just for a minute. I'm all right now. <laughs> Those of you that are praying for my mental health, kick it up a notch, will you? I mean, <laughs> in order to preach the way I do, I've got to overcome a lot, you know. I mean, I tell everybody, you know, I did a lot of LSD back in the 60s. It had no effect on me at all. So, uh, just say it, amen? Hallelujah. But I think you guys know who I'm talking to. I think this is one of those things that you need to cogitate over. I think this is one of those teachings that you kind of got to marinate in for a while. Mama Susan, she's got a great saying. She says, we live in a microwave world, but we got to marinate in God. You know? And what you marinate in, you take the flavor of that, right? Makes the whole business a lot better, amen? So I want you to think about this. I want you to, if there's tapes or anything of this, uh, I'm going to ask you to get one. A CD or I said tapes. Luckily, I didn't say eight tracks. <laughs> we chiseled this on a rock. Anyway, uh, look, I did the I did the lounge show on the ark, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and don't you laugh, because when he said, "Let there be light," you flipped the switch, <laughs> and you said, "Sir, yes, sir." <laughs> aye, aye, Kevin. Anyway. Uh, Anyhow, what I'd rather pray is that the Lord illuminate these words to your hearts. I would, I would like, God, if you would just please, by your Holy Spirit, move over the hearts of my friends and meet their needs. The parts of these things that were said today that you gave me to say in this place to these people, and including the people that are online right now. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, take these things and brush them lightly like a feather from an angel's wing. Get their attention sweetly, Lord. Let them see where the need is. Let them see the walls they're behind the stagnant water they're settling for, and give them a desire for the deep. Call to them, Lord, from the deep, from the deep places, and let them have the courage to dig those wells until they're one with the voice that calls them. I pray this, Lord, because I love them, and I'm a human being. My love, my love is imperfect by definition, but your love is perfect. And you want for them every good and pleasant gift. Your plan is to prosper them and to do them no harm, to give them hope and a future. God, I pray that those who have become satisfied will become hungry again. Those who've had their thirst slaked need to become thirsty again. God, pour back in the courage. God, pour back in the call. God, take us all where you want us to be so that we can be proficient in what we do and be a benefit to those in the line with us. Ask it in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to share a couple of concerns with you, then I'm going to turn it back over to our beloved Pastarde. <laughs> I don't know if that's a real word, but it sounds good. 
You need to not really say it real fast, though, because you can Never mind. Um, I'm just saying. Anyway, um, Susan, Mama Susan and I have moved to California. Uh, it's been something that we've been wanting to do for some time because we're getting older. And as you can see, I'm not as steady on my feet as I used to be. And that's where our kids are. So we've decided, I'll be 67 in November. I've been on the road for 41 years. And uh, the Lord's blessed. Uh, a lot of people have gotten saved. We, we, don't have, um, we don't have a house or anything like that. We live in a 26-foot travel trailer at the back of my daughter's property at the moment. So I would say that... Uh, we are marginally homeless. <laughs> and we have a goat across the parking lot there, across the driveway. We have a goat and some sheep. And then we have chickens right behind us. And the pig's coming home this weekend. Yay. He's been up at the petting zoo. It's what he does in the summertime. And then he comes home during the winter. His name is Wilbur. He's basically my grand pig. Uh, He's a good pig. He's a good pig. He really is a good pig. Uh, our family is so used to him that when we have parties and people come over, we just let Wilbur out. And he just wanders amongst the tables and the party goers and you know, greets everybody with his big pink flat snotty nose. It's very nice for us. <laughs> anyway, um, so God has given... Susan and I have this vision called Shiloh. And I'm telling you these things because I, I, I pass them by the pastor first. I don't just get up and do things like this unless I have permission. And he gave me permission. Shiloh means safe and peaceful. And I want to spend the rest of my life providing a safe and peaceful place for pastors who are going through hard times, who've hit a rock shelf in their digging of their well, to come and sit on the back porch and drink sweet tea and talk to an old miner. You know? There's none of that. There's no place for ministers to go. We have 1,800 people dropping out of the ministry every month in this country. Uh, they say that the kids that graduate from seminary today won't make it in the ministry five years. 80%. Meanwhile, the world we live in is going to hell in a handbasket because there's no hand on the rudder anymore. No hand on the tiller. And until we can get these guys to the place where they can get back on the horse, until we can get these girls to the place where they're willing to get back on the horse, you know, not because of anything, but in spite of everything, because in the end of the day, it's never about them, it's just about us and him, until somebody that's been around enough, has enough scars, has enough dents, has enough rust on their armor, has enough time and grade to sit down and say, Troop, this is how you do it. Or this is how I do it. Take what of that is good for you and go and rock the world. Just know one thing. There's always a place for you to come home to. And you got a mom and dad in the Lord that love you, believe in you, and are proud of you. Don't need another book by John Maxwell. We don't need another conference. All those things are just fine. But what we don't have is some place for people to come and sit and just say, Pops, I really messed up. How do I get past this? What we don't have is an old man who put his arm around that person and say, you're going to be okay. It's going to be okay, and you're going to be okay. Because no matter what's going on, Jesus is still on the throne. Amen? Amen? So we have three needs at this point. First of all, I need some time off. I mean, I've been on the road continually for 41 years. And, and I'm asking the Lord to give me people who are willing to give one-time gift to help me raise 40,000 bucks so that we can run the ministry 
and we can pay our payrolls uh, without me being on the road all the time between now and, and the first of the year, that's all. You know, not ever, I'm not retiring. I just, we've just moved all the way across country and we have to get set up, you know. I have to help Mama Susan find a home. Uh, I need to help Mama Susan get things set up. We need to, we need to retool everything and I can't do that if I'm running around the world. So, trying to raise, we're trying to raise the amount of 40 grand. Um, and if we have that, we can, we can pay all the people that we're, we only have two people in there part time, but we can pay their payroll. We can pay Mom and Susan and I's payroll, which is set by our board. And we can, you know, do all the things we need to do for the ministry. And so we're asking for help. The other thing is, is I'm not, uh, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm not as old as I thought I was, but I'm not as young as I used to be. And so my travel is going to be necessarily somewhat limited as we go forward. Well, the only income I've ever had has been offerings and selling product. Now, we're trying to figure out new ways to create new income streams. But in the meantime, what we need is something that we've really never had. We need partners. We need people who will commit and churches who will commit to be part of the Shiloh vision on a monthly basis. We need that really, really badly. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. People say, well, I can't give a lot of money. We don't need a lot of money. We need a lot of people to give a little bit of money. <laughs> you know, that's what we do. You know, if I get 100,000 people to give me $20 a month, whew, I'll take all y'all to France. And then the third thing we need is, is we, need, we need the direction of the Lord. We need the hand of God. We need, we need discernment. We need wisdom. And if you guys, as our brothers and sisters, will pray for us and keep us lifted up, then that'll help a lot. So, and these are not linear gifts, okay? Well, I'll do this, but I won't do this or this. Or I'll do this, but I won't do this or this. I'll do this, but I won't do this and this. This is a stack pie, honey. If you don't cut a slice, you can get it all. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, I want to thank Pastor John and... and uh, and his family for being friends and, and loving on me. Now, there's no way to say how much that means. I want to thank my friends in this church that I've known for several years now for remembering me and, and being friends because friends are a good thing to have. I want to uh, thank Pastor for trusting me enough to put this need in front of you because it's hard for a pastor to let some evangelist get up in his pulpit and shear his sheep. It's not a good thing. And people, and guys shouldn't do it. Um, that's why in all the times that I've come here, you've never seen me take an offering. Because I, I, don't, I don't think that's right. Just saying. So this time, though, I asked the pastor. I told him what I, was gonna, I needed to do. Would it be all right? And I told him, no harm, no foul. If you say no, I'm cool with that, you know. But he said, sure, go ahead. So this is the first time. This is my first meeting since moving to California. First meeting uh, since we have hit the new ground and, and began to dig the new well. We're only about three shovels into it, so we got ways to go. And... Uh, and thank you for your consideration and for your love. I didn't used to have to sit down after I preached. Do you know that? Well, it's just the goodness of God that there was a chair here. Hallelujah. Amen. Thanks, everyone. I, I, I'm going to try to get a little wilder tonight. All right. All right. Get you a good nap? Yeah. I'm going to take a nap. Can you hold out that food? <laughs> you can't hold it. That lady right there knows how to cook. Thank you very much. <laughs>
tonight, if, 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 if it's in the Lord's timing and it's in his flow, I want you to share with the people some of the things you shared with me when you sat with Oral Roberts, things that, you, that he said to you, things that were uh, your conversations with Brother Graham, um, time spent with people in, uh, when the body of Christ was where it was through the 80s, 90s. Stories like that do us good for today because the body of Christ goes through high, high times and low times. High times and low times. We tend to porpoise like this. There is uh, every, as I said, every, every generation has its voice that speaks to that local generation. Here just happens to be a man that reaped an entire generation of, of new believers. And um, that doesn't just happen because you happen to have a new little gig or you got a, you got a new little twist. No, there's an anointing on you to do that. The new birth is a mystery. The Bible says that the wind blows where it decides to, and you hear it coming, you, and you, you see it going, but you don't know where it came from or where it went. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. The new birth is a mystery. And God will call people like Mike to reap two million examples of that mystery that took place as we watched it, the phenomenon that took place in that ministry through the 1980s. Now, uh, Mike shared with you... Uh, just, I think it was two meetings ago that uh, his son Brendan passed away, and that's been two years. He, he, he passed away in uh, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. Okay, so it's been a few years. Okay, now, you know, most the the uh, attrition rate in the ministry. If you lose a child, most guys just get on out of the ministry, and never go back in it again. That's that is usually the story. Mike hung in there and stayed with the ministry. Uh. So the fact that you're raising up a rest house doesn't surprise me at all. And uh, did you know that it helps me to realize when we're, when we're talking about, he's talking about 1,800 ministers a month are leaving the ministry. 2,000 churches a month a few years ago are being put in, are being stopped in the United States. And 6,500 are folding. So that's the condition of the local church. So... The fact that we've been here 19 years tells me that we have beat the odds. And yeah, there have been times I've wanted to sit down and rest, but no, I just didn't rest. You just get up and go. But it did me good to hang out with him yesterday, and, and uh, it, there was a rest that came just by hanging out with him. He said something that I thought was really interesting. He said through the 1980s, he said there were everybody, every theologian in the world was on TBN and uh, every show in the world. He said, but he would come up and everybody would bust out laughing. He said... People just needed to laugh. Everybody was so theological, but nobody ever found anything funny to say. It was time to laugh a little while. All right. So, with that in mind, I think uh, the Lord's given him a new uh, season for ministry. Uh, uh, having to move to North uh, California to be with the rest of his kids. How many do you have? Eight kids, 15 grandkids, three great-great-great-great-grandkids. And um, so I think it's right that mom and dad move home, be with the kids, and not be scattered all over the country. So I want you to ask the Lord what he'd have you do regard, regarding Mike Warnke Ministries and his uh, outreaches. He still has products that go all over the world. He still has uh, broadcasts that go all over the world. He's... Um, uh, this Shiloh house, I think, is going to be an excellent thing for pastors. Now, the Lord's used the 41 years that he's got, over 40 years of ministry experience, and he's given it to young guys, given that ministry experience to young guys. Rather than try to go through the har school of hard knocks yourself, go to the guy that's been there and, and save you a few pitfalls and a few mistakes that you would be sure to make on your own unless you had a father in the faith. Scripture says, Paul said, you have many instructors in Christ, 10,000 of them, but you have not many fathers. He said, I have begotten you through the gospel. Y'all remember John Scott came here and played a piano? It may be that he'll be here tonight. Why don't we pray and ask, ask the Lord to send his backside here, have him play. I'd like, if, if uh, he's one of Mike's uh, disciples and if, uh, if he'll come, I want him to play the piano for you. And that'll be tonight at 6 o'clock as well. So it'll be a, a little different meeting tonight. Right at 6, we'll get you in and, and get you out in, in uh, due time. You make your checks payable to Church on the Word, and we'll 
be a blessing to this ministry. Cash envelopes are available to you. These gentlemen will, will uh, hand those out. Just raise your hand if you need a cash envelope. There you go, right there. Thank you. One over here. Come on up, gents. Um, can I have somebody on the keys or um, um, Alan, if you will, please? There's another hand right over here, gentlemen. Okay. All right. It'll do us good to be back in a, a Sunday night service. It used to be. People didn't know what to do with themselves if they didn't have church to go to on Sunday night. You did? We, we had Sunday night services for years. Eight, first eight, nine years of this ministry. Every Sunday night. I don't know what he's playing, but it sounds good inside me. It doesn't matter what he's playing Just long as there's a song In my heart I'll sing songs, love songs to him All the rest of my life <laughs> I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Father, I receive the offerings for this great, great man of God that we have among us. Lord, I thank you for the infusion of grace that's been on his ministry. And I thank you for the infusion of grace that's coming to his ministry. Not only for those that are going to sit at his feet, but for the fire that you'll put back in his feet to hit the road again. Once called to the road, always called to the road. Once called to seek and to save that which is lost, always seek and save that which is lost. There are those that still wait patiently for the Spirit of God to move among them and send this minister right here to send Mike Warnke to that town, to that city, to that place. Here we are in the body of Christ. We're among family. And so this is not so much an evangelistic meeting this morning as is his anointing. But we appreciate it and embrace it. And by doing so, we buy into and purchase the anointing by Sowing into his ministry, that same spirit of reaping will be on this church and be on this local fellowship. And I thank you for that mystery. And we thank you for the work that's here, that's done. We sow into it cheerfully and with blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.